For years I've been fascinated by the idea of berserkers, men who in history are recorded as having achieved incredible feats of strength and violence in battle. But increasingly in recent years, more and more people have started to dismiss the idea of berserkers as merely being exaggerations or fantasy. So I decided to search for myself to find out, is there really a hidden history of the berserkers? He didn't feel like he was human. Would either of us expect to be able to last five minutes with anyone in that caliber? There's no way. They became like wolves. They became these liminal creatures. Yeah, like blood does weird things to people. When people are around a lot of blood, Austin Harriff was found growling and biting one of his victims after a horrific double murder. In a 38-page report, a forensic psychologist says Harriff believed he was half dog, half man when he attacked Michelle Michon and John Stevens two years ago in their home. Police found him on top of Stevens, biting and chewing on his flesh. On the night of August 15th, 2016, in the town of Tequesta, north of Miami, a seemingly normal and healthy 19-year-old sophomore student named Austin Haruf reportedly attacked a man before entering the garage of the South Florida home and killing two of his neighbors. The Florida college student accused of killing a couple and then chewing on one of the victim's faces is conscious. Local station WPEC reports Austin Haruf is awake and responsive. The Martin County Sheriff's Office has not been able to question the teen since the incident. Police say they found Haruf chewing on the face of John Stevens, who had been beaten and stabbed to death along with his wife Michelle at their home. When police arrived, they found the bodies of John Stevens and Michelle Michon. According to police, Mr. Stevens' body was lying on the driveway. The young man who attacked him was found on top of Mr. Stevens. The man was said to be wearing only underwear. He was snarling and eating the face of his neighbor. Fisher said he was in bed and heard strange noises, then a scream. He ran outside. I saw um, him slamming Michelle's car door and then a little fuzzy. Um, I saw Michelle come out of the man door into the garage and him grab a hold of Michelle and throw her to the ground. According to court documents, a deputy ordered Haruf, the young man, to get off of Mr. Stevens at gunpoint, while another used an electric stun gun on him. And I saw another male on a what they call like a side mount grappling hole. He had his legs intertwined, his arm wrapped around the male. And he had his fingers like a fish hook in his mouth, pulling his face off, trying to pull his cheek apart. Was he saying anything? He was, he was ground. The police who arrived on scene tried to subdue him, but failed to get control of the man until he was attacked by a police dog. Taken from an article by WPBF 25 News. While the suspect was at the hospital, the detective observed Haruf spitting out what appeared to be human flesh. The detective said he also saw that Haruf had human hair in his mouth. In a 38-page report written by Dr. Philip Resnick 
of the University Hospitals of Cleveland. Quote, the fact that Mr. Haruf persisted in biting the male victim in the presence of police officers, in spite of threats of being shot, being tased, and receiving multiple kicks to the head, suggests that Mr. Haruf was actively psychotic. And after the findings that Mr. Haruf did not have any designer drugs in his system at the time of the attack, Dr. Resnick wrote, quote, It was unlikely that it was a drug-induced psychosis that led to the attacks. There are some who believe in a very safe version of history. One where everything written down and translated over the centuries must have an easy and comfortable explanation. They protect their view of history from any notions or accounts that seem too fantastical, too foreign to the minds of a modern person living in a developed nation. Anything that echoes of being too strange, too wild, well, that can be safely dismissed as the exaggerations and mythologizing of people with overactive imaginations, or who lack a modern understanding of science. Their view of history leaves very little room to the idea that the people of the past may have known their own reality more intimately, with all its beautiful, mysterious, and frightening details, than we can hope to know ourselves. In earlier points of history, and in certain regions of the old world, although just as frightening, such behavior would have been far less unheard of. From the deep forests of the Celtic and Germanic world, to the open steppe of the Caucasus and the mountains of Iran, a martial tradition of madness and might carved a psychological wound of terror into the memories of all who encountered them. In the harsh lands of Northern Europe, these men became known as the Berserkers. In the state of Nebraska, on a Sunday in April of 2020, at 4.05 a.m., 6'4", UFC light heavyweight fighter Anthony Smith was awoken by his wife to an unknown man inside their home. Um, my wife woke me up, uh, panicked, and said, there's somebody in the house. And so I jump up and I hear, uh, I hear a man's voice screaming at the top of his lungs and he uh, he's, it's really he's not really saying anything it's it's just uh, it, it was it was like from deep within it was really loud uh all the way till he ran out of breath and then he would take a breath and scream again and i just you know i kind of just ran him over uh and we started fighting ufc star anthony lionheart smith has fought the best fighters around the world but his bout over the weekend was the most important of his life. As soon as I came out, he just looked at me and kind of flexed and, and like, like, it looked like he was trying to scare me. And, you know, then, and then just, just panic. It's like the most terrifying moment of your life. He was just screaming at the top of his lungs uh, over and over and over. A neighbor's surveillance video shows the suspect running down the street. Smith accidentally left his garage door open. The suspect stops and runs right in. And it's amazing to me to think that you're a pro fighter. You're one of the best fighters on the planet. And you say that this was one of the toughest fights of your life. Now, obviously, the circumstances are different than when you're fighting in the octagon. But here's a guy who's maybe, what, 70 pounds lighter than you, and you can't put him away. Like, you are trying to put him away. You were, you were trying to save your family here, right? And he just wouldn't go away. He's not very big. He's like 165 or 170 pounds, uh, but he's super strong.
Penny Smith fights home intruder, man charged with criminal pe- trespass. Yeah, you were telling me about that. Apparently yeah. the guy was tough, too. Like, Smith and, said... And smaller than him. He said the guy was like 170 pounds. And the guy took everything he could throw at him. Maybe he's on meth. He said, no normal human being is, is able to fight like that. He said, I am by no means the baddest dude on the planet. <laughs> Listen, he's top 100. Oh, dude. Out of all the humans on the planet, Anthony Smith is one of the top 100 baddest motherfuckers Straight on the earth. He's in it, 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 we're fighting the whole time until the cops got here. So it took from the time the 911 phone call was made, it was just over five minutes for the police to get here. Um, the cops come in, he starts fighting them too, and, and they get me out of out of the room. Um, and, and my entire computer room is just you know, it's covered in blood, it's on the blood on the walls. There's it's a mess. But the rational mind can't comprehend this, so when the news broke, the internet MMA nerds were very confused. The cognitive dissonance caused people to lie to themselves, automatically. You can't read a discussion of this story anywhere without finding multiple claims that Haberman was a state champion, or college wrestler, or even a Division I college wrestler. In reality, he didn't even win a district title in high school, and he didn't wrestle in college. He only won one match at the state tournament and was eliminated after three matches. After looking into these modern day accounts, I wanted to hear directly from someone with more experience. So I gave my friend Nathan Smith a call, who's had to deal with intense physical altercations reminiscent of these situations as a part of his professional career. So Nathan, thank you for taking the time to join us. What do you make of the situation with Austin Roof? I've been in I've been in a number of situations where I've had to grapple with people who are presenting themselves in a very similar way. What strikes me the most is, again, to say like how animalistic it is. And by that, I mean just like the biting. Him being tased and that being ineffective. There are some people that tasers just don't do a whole lot to for whatever reason, whatever condition they're in. Um, This guy, if he was in an altered state of mind, um, it might be one of those things where he was able to just override override whatever was happening on the physiological level at the time seemed believable you know like if he's on some crazy drugs like no normal human is able to fight like that like uh and he he took everything that i gave him you know like every punch every knee every elbow uh he he took every single one of them and never slowed down and kept fighting me there's weight classes and fighting for a reason and for this to be the other way around where the heavier of the two is the more experienced one and he was the one to have so much trouble yeah that's exceptionally strange what was your reaction seeing the way that he screamed and sort of his sudden snap to to just rage well i saw that clip for the first time that kind of freaked me out a bit if it were a dog doing that we wouldn't think it's that strange but it's the fact that it's a human acting that way is what's so unsettling about it they were in a fight for five minutes before the police showed up and can can either of us imagine going toe to toe with a world class like Joe Rogan described him as top 100 ranked in the world, right? Would either of us expect to be able to last five minutes with anyone in that caliber? There's no way, right? There's no way. We're talking about a completely different world where, you know, it's not like you and I have seen um, a bunch of people get their skulls cleaved in half with an ax. We don't have those kind of memories. so going into that sort of a mental state where you're having to process that sort of trauma, that's not something that we're as familiar with. Whereas these men who have been through that kind of combat, it's probably a lot easier for them to flip a kind of switch. Blood does weird things to people. When people are around a lot of blood, there's a, people react in very strange ways. It, it triggers processes and, um, I think that they were more tapped into that than we are. It was odd. He, he wasn't responding the way that typically people do, whether it's submissions or, or pain or, or, or strikes. So he didn't respond to anything. He didn't feel like he was human. The Icelandic lawman and writer 
Snorri Sturluson, described these men in Yingling Saga, recorded shortly after 1220 AD in the following way. Quote, Odin's men went without hauberks and raged like dogs or wolves. They bit their shields and were strong like bears or bulls. They killed men, but neither fire nor iron hurt them. This is called Berserker Gang. Unlike the orderly phalanx of most ancient armies, berserker warfare was wild and reckless, attacking like starved predatory animals. So just as I'm editing this video, my friend sends me a link. One of these crazy savage attacks just happened again. I mean, these attacks are just insane, just brutal stuff. I reached out to my friend Fjolnir, a native Icelander, because Icelandic today is so similar to the original Old Norse of the texts in the sagas, and I wanted to hear his own take on why he thought the Berserkers may have had a different origin in the Norse background than they did in other European cultures prior to that, and hear his own original theory on why the word Berserker may have different roots than we think. Uh, sagas are not that explicitly clear about what the berserkers are. Speaking Icelandic and being able to read it in Old Norse and see the, how the language, the subtle changes in the language, because for example, some words can have double meaning. There are many lingos that we don't use today that can be easily be mistranslated. How they are described. They seem to be described as like MMA fighters or, or, or you know, some kind of status within society, not, not a sep, like not a unit, like a cult, separate from that society. It's not a separate faction. It's just like a some sort of status or a, or a lingo for a dude who fought in a particular manner. They're not described as some sort of unique cult with unique rituals. It, 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 they could have been that, but we just don't know. High speculation, like my take, is that they were simply guys that really loved challenging other guys to tools. Erik Eirikur Hákonarsson, the Earl of Leit and the governor of Norway and the Earl of Northumbria, it is said that you know he forbade dueling by law and actual berserkers. Dueling and berserkers, they seem to be connected right there. In ancient Assyria, then bordering on Indo-European speaking lands, some two and a half thousand years before the days of the medieval Vikings, King Tukulti Ninurta fought a war against the Hittites and the Babylonians. In the surviving poem, giving an account of King Tukutli's Assyrian warriors, they're described as being shapeshifters, who took on the form of the Assyrian eagle dragon Anzu, tying up their hair and fighting without clothing. They're described as acting with wild abandon, and dancing with sharpened weapons. They are furious, raging, taking forms strange as Anzu. They charge forward, furiously, to the fray without armor. They had stripped off their breastplates, discarded their clothing. They tied up their hair and polished their weapons. The fierce heroic men danced with sharpened weapons. They blasted at one another like struggling lions with eyes aflash. While the fray, particles drawn in a whirlwind, swirled around in combat. Some scholars speculate that the Assyrians, bordering on the Eurasian steppe, may have adopted such berserk warrior practices from their neighbors to the north, the Indo-Europeans. Quote from University of Hawaii professor Dr. Michael P. Spiedel, 
He writes of the ancient origins of the berserker practice as likely originating and spreading from the earliest days of the Indo-Europeans. Quote, to linguists, words and concepts shared by Indo-Europeans suggest that fighting madly was a very old custom that originated perhaps in the 4th millennium BC. The word for mad attack, ice, shared by Vedic, Iranian and Germanic warriors, makes it likely that the berserk fighting style comes from the time before the dispersal of the Indo-Europeans. These existing traditions in Indo-European descended lands is where the theory of the Indo-European Koryos is derived. Indo-Europeans as the likely root of this tradition are speculated as having had detachments of young, unmarried men who lived like wolves in packs, raiding foreign settlements and hunting in the wilds. After studying Iron Age Norse berserkers, I wanted to learn more if there really might have been a deeper connection between Iron Age Norse Berserkers and the Indo-Europeans who preceded them. So because of that, I reached out to Tom Rousel, UK historian and filmmaker, to see if he could shed some light on the subject. What was the actual impetus that drove the Indo-Europeans to spread around the world? We can see from the Luperci in the Roman culture, the Vrachas in India, the Menabund in Germanic culture, and the Kuros in Greek culture, that there was this common uh, cultural trait that we can reliably reconstruct among the Proto-Europeans called the Koreos, which involved bands of young teenage boys, unmarried men, going out and living in liminal spaces in the wild breaking the taboos of their own society, becoming like wolves, liminal creatures, seen as the opposite of the normal established uh, values of human society. The wolf is a criminal, a thief, who lives on the outskirts, away from civilization, in the wild, preying upon mankind. And that's what these men, these young boys, did. They became like wolves. They became these liminal creatures who were heavily associated in Indo-European mythology with death and the liminal space. We can also reconstruct in Indo-European uh, cosmology the idea of a dog or wolf as a psychopomp that leads the souls of the dead in the underworld. And that's sh still evident in the mythologies we have uh, surviving today, such as uh, the three-headed dog of Hades in Greek mythology, uh, Kerberos, and in uh, Norse mythology you have Garmr uh, and other dogs of hell, and in the uh, Indo-Iranic traditions there are also these four-eyed dogs of the underworld. Dogs and wolves are quite interchangeable in this Indo-European mythology, and archaeological evidence supports what the mythological and the historical evidence shows about this wolf cult, because they looked at some uh, burials of the Srabnaya culture on the steppe and they had these very bizarre rituals involving beloved dogs that had had good lives, been well looked after, but had then been dissected and decapitated and mutilated as part of a ritual, which was likely the ritual in which a boy became one of the Koryos. He had to kill a, family, a beloved family dog, become like a wolf. In Egil Saga Skaragrimsona, men are described who would go into great battle fury, behaving like wolves and bears, and were prized warriors in battle for their utter recklessness, seeming immunity to pain and wounds, and unparalleled strength. In 1066, during Harold Sigurdsson's failed invasion of England, a single berserker held off the entire Anglo-Saxon army at the crossing of Stamford Bridge for hours, killing any Anglo-Saxon who attempted to cross, until Saxon soldiers managed to get beneath the bridge and stab him from beneath. This quality of the Norse, who are a subset of the Germanic peoples, was well documented throughout Germanic lands by the Romans, who feared and admired these animal-cloaked and furious warriors. Germanic berserks 
are seen vividly in the stone reliefs on Trajan's column, which depicts the Roman Dacian Wars at the start of the 2nd century AD. These berserks are depicted as large, bare-chested, and bare-footed warriors, standing nearly a head taller than the armored and helmeted legionaries and auxiliaries at their sides. Berserk practice in Germanic history is tied most closely to the cult of Odin, also known as Woden, Odin, and Wotan, who himself was believed to be a shapeshifter, and was the one who gave his warriors the ability to fight as mad dogs or wolves, be immune from fire and iron, kill at a blow, and have the strength of wild bulls and bears. In the Torslunda plates found on the Swedish island of Oland, we have clear depictions of men dressed with bearskins, performing a berserker ritual, guided by a man in a twin-horned helmet, holding a spear in each hand. The detail that this man is missing an eye, and holding spears instead of a sword or axes, associates him heavily with the Odinic cult, assuming it is not a portrayal of Odin directly. In the Sutton Hoo ship burial found in England, we also find shockingly similar art on the helmet itself, depicting more than one of the same twin-horned figure, holding spears in each hand. This provides further archaeological evidence to back up the much earlier Roman historian Cornelius Tacitus's writings, as he wrote of Germanic youths who, quote, practiced the sport bound in the dance amid swords and lances. The 2022 film The Northman plays out a scene with incredible accuracy to the Torslunda plates and the Sutton Hoo helmet images, and presents Norse berserkers on screen in full glory and terror. It is said that Þeir grenjuðu sem hundar og bitu Í skjaldarendur og óðu eld brennanda berum fótum Which means they howled like dogs And bit their, the edge of their shields And rushed into burning flames With bare feet And that there's also no evidence that they used mushrooms That's, that's um, not mentioned anywhere in, in the sagas or any sort of rituals. If they did mushrooms, it would be explicit, I think, in the sagas that they... It, if it was a strong part of their identity. Thracians, another Indo-European speaking people, were well known for fielding bare-chested warriors in battle. The Roman historian Titus Livius wrote in 171, of the utterly daring and reckless behavior of such Thracians charging against cavalry on foot in battle, saying of them, quote, In this formation, the two armies, almost equally matched in the numbers of their cavalry and light infantry, first of all the Thracians, like wild beasts, kept in cages and suddenly released, set up a deafening roar and charged the Italian cavalry on the right wing with such fury that, in spite of their experience at war and their native fearlessness, they threw them into disorder. The infantry on both sides snapped the lances of the cavalry with their swords, cut at the legs of the horses, and stabbed them in the flanks. The Roman poet Virgil describes the Etruscan Herminius similarly. Great souled, great bodied, greatly armed warrior, flowing blonde hair on his helmetless head, bare-shouldered, unafraid of wounds, huge that he was fighting uncovered. Such vivid descriptions give clear inspiration for what Nietzsche coined as the blonde beast.
According to Byzantine historian Procopius, in the 6th century, Sklavoni, Slavic warriors, were also noted at times to have fought in combat without shirts, a clearly dangerous decision when facing bladed weaponry. After the berserker practice was banned in Scandinavia, we still find evidence of such battle behavior from island Celts in the 13th century, where we can find pawns of a 12th century chess set from the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides, depicting warriors who bite their shields in a fit of battle madness, a berserk behavior described directly in Inglinga Saga. And Irish warriors in the 13th century are recorded as having charged into battle naked, carrying only axes. Among earlier Celts further south in Europe, the Roman Polybius describes the Gaestae as fighting at the front completely naked, both because of their great confidence and their desire not to get their clothes caught in the brambles. And Diodorus Circulus writes that some Gauls fought naked, trusting that they were protected by nature. The bravery of the Gaul is immortalized in the statue known as the Dying Gaul, who, in the heroic nude, was sculpted in the 3rd century BC, and shows a lean but strong, mustached Celtic man in his final hours, bleeding from a wound through his ribs and wearing only a necklace. In Polybius's The Histories, he writes in Book 2, Chapter 29, quote, The Romans, however, were on the one hand encouraged by having caught the enemy between their two armies, but on the other they were terrified by the fine order of the Celtic host and the dreadful din. For there were innumerable horn blowers and trumpeters, and as the whole army were shouting their war cries at the same time, there was such a tumult of sound that it seemed that not only the trumpets and the soldiers, but all the country round had got a voice and caught up the cry. Very terrifying too were the appearance and the gestures of the naked warriors in front, all in the prime of life and finely built men, and all in the leading companies richly adorned with gold torques and armlets. The sight of them indeed dismayed the Romans, but at the same time the prospect of winning such spoils made them twice as keen for the fight. Aside from berserker cults, warrior bands in Gaelic Ireland, called Fianna, behaved in the way that many speculate the Indo-European Koryos did, by living in the wilds, hunting, raiding villages, and training, all of which served as an initiation into manhood and into the patriarchal Mannerbund style aristocracies of the age. The Spartans were legendary for their harsh training, and initiated their boys to the Agoge. And among young men identified as being potential leaders between the ages of 21 and 30, these were selected to undergo the Kryptaya, wherein they had to go out into the wilds unsupervised, being barefoot in winter, sleeping without shelter like wild animals and yearly were sent out to stalk and kill the strongest members from among the helot population with only knives, both to train the young men in the ways of hunting and killing, and to cull the most threatening from among the helots, who outnumbered the Spartans by a great factor. Spiedel also writes on the etymology of the term berserks as it evolved with time, saying, quote, in Old Norse, the word berserk at first meant a bear shirt warrior, but when the bera or bear became Bjorn, and the word berserk was no longer understood as bear warrior, and instead it came to mean bear shirt, since those who fought without shirt and armor were reckless madmen. And the word berserk took on its modern meaning of mad fighter. In the same fashion as the bear archetype of the berserker was the Ulfhedna, the wolf warrior, who wore the pelt of a wolf over their skin or chainmail when entering battle and howled madly. These men wore such pelts believing that the spirit of the animal could flow through them 
while they were in their berserker trance. These young boys didn't remain on the outskirts of society forever. Eventually, they would be reintegrated into their societies and they would become leaders of the very societies from which they had previously been outcast. It's these kinds of warrior bands that led to the foundation of Rome. Romulus and Remus appears to refer to exactly one of these wolf warrior bands. And indeed, this must have been the main factor that led to the spread of Indo-European cultures across the world and caused Indo-European culture and language to become so successful. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, it's it's unfathomable <laughs> until you until you have an opportunity to, to kind of brush against that world yourself. And sometimes it takes just traveling to the right countries or having certain experiences or um, yeah, I'm sure it, like a zookeeper would probably understand what's going on here, you know, a lot better than the average person. Um, or maybe certain anthropologists. Um, it's only because of where we are at this point in history that that's foreign to most people. But that's because we're the unusual ones. This time in history right now is unusual. Otherwise, this would be way more commonplace. I don't know how familiar you are with Joseph Conrad's work, but that book, it deals with a lot of these concepts. The thin line between civilized society and the madness of the wilderness and how that barrier between the two worlds is is paper thin and we like to pretend that walking around on these concrete roads with a police officer around we like to pretend that we're not actually still in the wilderness but it's there it still is and it could it could disappear quite easily you're making sure it's not just as simple as they took some mushrooms and went crazy and there's the berserker phenomenon explained it's like no there's this whole historical cultural um all these conditions the ritual everything that it, it sits within i think it's one of those things where people think it's really far away but that's only because they haven't they haven't encountered it yet and it's actually paper thin we're actually so close to that world all the time for those that believe tales of men going berserk are merely fantasy and exaggeration how will they feel to learn that such super physiological states of both body and mind are not limited to the imagination? Nor are they confined to the depths of history. The spirit of the berserker can still be reawoken. Let me know what you make of the Berserker phenomenon in the comments. I want to give a massive shout out to Christian Sloan Hall and a thank you for letting me use some of his masterful artwork in this video. He's got some absolutely metal pieces that you can buy prints of on his website, which I've linked below. It's phenomenal stuff. You guys have got to check it out. I also want to give an extra huge thank you and shout out to Tom Rousel for contributing his insights as a historian and filmmaker to this video. He does incredible work. He's got an immense knowledge of ancient history that will blow your mind. He's got a whole YouTube channel called Survive the Jive where you can learn way more about ancient history, especially history around the Indo-Europeans, and I've linked it below. So go check that out. I also want to give a huge thank you to the other filmmakers who've helped me create this video. It would not be possible without them. And also a thank you to the other guests who we had on today. I've linked all their content below. If you're interested at all in supporting Nordhuger and the content that I create here, I put a link down below as well to Patreon. These videos can be pretty expensive and time consuming to make, so any little bit of support is massively appreciated and helps me create more content just like this. If you want to learn more about this era of history, I've put a whole playlist here with other content I've created that I think you guys will really enjoy.
All right, now you need to fight me on the ice. No. To get the Berserker Rage out. Let's go! It's you or me! You you do not have, like, a thing hooked up so I can, like, hold this and fight you on the ice at the same time. Gotta do the Berserker dance with the spears. <laughs> I'm expecting you to, like, go up and down for, like, a split second, and then you go down, and then it just, like, <laughs> shatters. Just you know, these Berserkers, they're just, uh... It's like old school furries, so the more you think about it, it's just kind of gay. Wow, I'm still up. I, I would, I would, I'd come back from there. Are, are you going to explain the concept here? All right, to unlock our inner berserker rage potential, we have to get close to the elements. So I'm here in this frozen river. Half frozen. Half frozen river. You're doing good, you need help? Ah, Alright, we've unlocked! <laughs> Keep going, we've unlocked full berserker potential! This is Nordhugger Vlogs episode. <laughs> <laughs> episode one. Oh. What, what it's like to be a proper Nord in, in America. If you want to be a proper Nord, you have to <laughs> go out into the moderately populated area and do stupid shit. Exactly. This is just Vikings in 2022. We just do dumb shit in the woods. Oh my goodness, man. Yeah, well, <laughs> woo! Yeah. <laughs>